Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. Hi. Who's here tonight? Just just, just us. Show's getting I'm lonely st- lately, Aaron. I'm still not used to this freeform format yet. <laughs> it's still really awkward. Yeah. Well, you know, it's just like, I see it as we're just recording all of our pre-show talk. Yeah. Yeah. And and like, you know, we don't have to go back and try and remember the things that we wanted to talk about later. That's all. What are you drinking? For one thing, I don't work tomorrow. So I have a whole six pack here ready to go. Okay. But I have Sprech I have Sprecher's Hefeweizen. Sprecher's makes real beer? Yeah. I didn't know I, that. I picked this up in Milwaukee. When I we thought, went for Maker Fair. I thought they just make like root beer and really terrible alcoholic root beer. Didn't know they made beer beer. I didn't know that either. Huh. Is it good? Yeah, it's pretty decent. It's a wheat it's a it's a wheat ale. So it's more ailey, but it's good. It's pretty nothing nothing super special about it, but it's decent. I'm drinking a crowler. From Third Turn Brewing in Louisville, Kentucky, from my my recent work trip there, and um, this is Llama Juice IPA, and it says, "Do not age, drink fresh on the crowler." And I really wish I would have listened to that. I kept saving it for the podcast, and we kept postponing the podcast. And uh, it's like a week and a half old now, and I can tell, mm-hmm. but it's still delicious. So. Can you age any beer in a crawler? I don't think so. I don't think it it's a good it, idea. It's not a an, a very age appropriate container. No, it's like you know, you hope they sealed it good. And this one was sealed good cuz it's still nicely carbonated, but I can tell that it's sat in the refrigerator for a week and a half, but it's still tasty, so I'm going to drink it. So what have you been up to this week, Joe? Um bunch of stuff i've been printing all kinds of replacement parts to do the himera upgrade on the tool changer and prepping to do the retail part upgrade i want to do it all in one shot and make a nice video of it which means i'll never get it done it's really all that means but um that's that's been my main thing i've been printing a lot of the parts on the um prusa mini and I just love that little printer. It's it's my favorite little printer I've ever used. It it's um like I think you remember a few months ago I was talking about how mad my Ender made me because it made really good prints and was super cheap. Yeah. This is slightly more expensive and makes better prints. And I'm good. far less worried about it burning my house down. So okay. that's pretty sweet. Um Yeah. I'm definitely really excited that they came out with that because it hits that it hits that right price point where you don't feel bad recommending it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's not like, well, this is the printer I think you should buy, but I know you're going to buy an SR or a CR10, <laughs> so uh, I guess I'll just recommend a CR10. Like, no, it's and I love the flex plate. I know I talked about that before, and actually, I am looking into flex plates for everything. Like. We said that a couple weeks ago, but I, I just sent off DXFs to get flex plates, uh, find out about getting flex plates made for all of my other printers. Hmm. So nice. Um, What's it take to get that done? Being friends with somebody who listens to this show. Okay, you, but besides that, lift lift my beer to you know who you are. <laughs> like, like because you need a you need a magnetic subsurface, right? Yes. Um, So, I think if you were just like a person, what I as we all are, well, like you know, if if you were a person who didn't know the people that I know, uh, this is how I would go about it. I would buy a flexible magnetic uh, sheet from somebody like Th Three D or Printed Solid that sells the magnetic sheet because they're very easy to cut. But, like, you could buy a magnetic sheet already, but I don't know if they would stand up to the heat. 
And now that things come with adhesive pre-applied, I never want to deal with the two-sided appliable adhesive sheets that we used to buy back in the day. That was the worst part of replacing a bed surface was putting... Because, like, what it was was a piece of glue with two pieces of non-stick paper. (laughs) And, like, you would peel one side off and hope that it didn't stick to that one. It only stuck to the (laughs) one that you wanted it to stick to, and it never worked out. So... I would buy it from somebody who already had high temp adhesive magnet sheets bigger than the plate that I need because they're, they're trimmable typically. Um, so is the flex plate itself magnetic? The flex plate is just a piece of stainless steel or a piece of spring steel, not yeah, stainless steel. Stainless yeah. steel is not magnetic typically unless it's one of the like 4,000 series that rust. Um, so they're they're made out of spring steel, and spring steel is relatively easy to get laser cut at a local fab shop. So you will likely have to call a few places and work the magic of you know the phone to try to get the gross the plates cut, uh, especially if you only want one or two cut. But um, it's not that hard to find a small laser shop that's willing to just cut them for you. You just got to look around a little bit. So that would be the route that I would go. Buy a pre-made magnet sheet from somebody who sells them that is larger than the bed you need so you can trim it. And then send a DXF to a laser shop. So how do you apply the magnet sheet to your... I'm guessing that goes on top of your existing heat bed? Yes. So in both of my cases, I have a piece of uh, borosilicate glass on the lull spot in the tool changer. So the magnet sheet would go on the borosilicate glass. And then um, the flex bed goes on top of the magnet sheet. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty great. Um. Yeah, when you're when you're building yours, you have to take into account certain things like um, the tool changer has the Swiss clips, which is how E3D holds the borosilicate glass to the uh, heated bed. There are these. I'll show them to you, Aaron, because you can see me in webcam. Is this little like paper clip looking thing? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Apparently, you can't buy these in the States, but they're, like, super prevalent all over uh, Great Britain. Um, But, um, so you have to take into account weird things that the uh, stainless steel sheet needs to clear in your DXF. So I have notches cut out of my DXF to clear the Swiss clips. And on the lull spot, I have notches cut out of the corners to clear the leveling washers. And then... If you're not leveling from the top of your bed surface, uh, like on the little spot I'm leveling from the washers, I have to take that extra thickness into account with my Z offset so I don't crash the Z head. Yeah, little things like that. But You know, Joe, I saw a guy on Reddit this week. He had uh, magnetic flex plates on his printer, and then he made a 3D printed robot arm, and it pulled the flex plate off the printer (laughs) and it put a new one on. Oh, wonderful. Yes, it's perfect. So, uh, another (laughs) one of our listeners sent me a robot arm this morning. Not like sent me a physical robot arm, but sent me a listing for a robot arm. You know, it's odd that I had to question that. (laughs) I was going, I was going to, I'm like, you know, People do send you random shit. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Nah, dude, if a robot arm showed up at my house, you and Chris would be the first ones to hear about it. <laughs> be like, dude, come over. <laughs> Somebody sent me a robot arm. No, um, uh, it, it prompted a fun discussion because it it's a little, it's like a hundred pound robot arm with a three kilogram payload. So a very small desktop, not desktop, but like, 
bench top robot meant for lab applications. Mm-hmm. But um, and they didn't want much for it. Uh, but it didn't come with a controller. And uh, Joe's asking, like, why are there all these robots floating around that don't have controllers? And it, it's because, especially with the small arms, they're very mechanically sound. There's not much to break in them. Like maybe you get a click in your harmonic drive or like you burn out a motor or something, but they're, they're pretty stout little machines, but the ro- robot controllers themselves are you know, big sensitive electronic boxes that die and are very expensive to replace. So then you get like a university or a lab or somebody who's like, well, I don't want to replace this controller. Now I've got this robot arm. I'll just give the robot arm away or scrap it, sell it for scrap value. And then you know, people like this guy that had this robot arm end up with this robot arm. Cause they're like, Oh, I'm going to get a robot arm and I'm going to, they have dreams of building uh, flex plate remover robots. And then they get it and mm-hmm. building a robot controller is not like building a CNC controller. <laughs> what? It is not. So like with the CNC controller and yeah, we they don't just take G code. So, you know, that's, um, <laughs> to cook. Let's Chris. go down this rabbit hole. That's Let's a whole it. other thing. <laughs> Let's do it. We have, we don't have any structure. Let's do it. <laughs> Jesus. No, robots totally don't take G code unless they do. Um, oh shit! Right? Yeah. So, um, you know, robots are anywhere from four to six degrees of freedom, typically. So, um, there's the kinematics to figure out how to get a coordinate system that's at the base of the robot to translate into something that is meaningful in 3d space at the hand. And all that math has to happen in the robot controller. And then the robot controller typically has a either compiled language or uses something like C plus plus or Java. Uh, Uh, Oh God. Yeah. uh, Yeah. This, this particular robot, it's control software took in, Java, C++, J++, which I didn't know was a thing. What the hell is that? And um, Looking it up. Visual something. Uh, it might have been Visual C. Visual J++. Uh, Microsoft's discontinued implementation of Java. <laughs> That's all I need to know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So... You know, they they could take in things like that, but industrial robots typically have a more compiled language, and they translate those simple commands into like the robot moves over here and it opens up a gripper and it does a thing, right? Mm-hmm. But there's like a whole fucking thing <laughs> to quote Chris that has to happen <laughs> between. <laughs> You know, th- this move command and this robot arm. And there aren't a lot of good open source implementations of it. So, like, Linux CNC can program a nine degree of freedom robot. But I have yet to see a software package that can generate the robot code to go into Linux CNC. So, like, Linux CNC can send the joint commands to move around a robot. But I have yet to see anybody make a program to program those joint commands to send to that robot. If somebody knows about it, please send it to me on Twitter. I I want to see it. I might go get this robot then. Because <laughs> I could build a Linux CNC control box. Um, you know, and then there's uh other companies like uh Roboteers. They're a uh a Canadian robot company that made a six degree of freedom version of the BCN movie. which is really, yes, which is a slightly nicer version of a different open source robot. <laughs> and you know, the movie is terrible. And the Roboteers version is a little <laughs> better. It's, 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 it's a robot arm. 
made out of 3D printed parts with stepper motors and the things run off of a ramp board. It's you can't have high hopes for it from the beginning. And it's got a really, really low payload. I still want to build one because like I have all the stuff here and like it would just be a really fun project to build. But the movement that I've seen from them is very herky jerky and not awesome. Yeah. But the Roboteers guys built a robot controller that is Raspberry Pi based called the Slush Engine, which is just a great name. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And it, it's like a, a ramps board for a six degree of freedom robot uh, that has you know big drivers, little drivers, and then tiny drivers for the, the wrist axes. Um and it's actually got a neat little program that runs on the Pi that lets you program it. But the slush engine itself is a few hundred dollars and it's all been cost prohibitive enough that I haven't wanted to dig into it. And building a controller for that admittedly extremely nice robot that the guy had. Um, I, I think, uh, like I told Joe this morning, it would have been like a year of solid work to do it and to make it work. Like, I don't think it would be a, a project that I would finish based on my current workload and completion rate. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting. Yeah. I've been, yeah. A robot arm has been on kind of on the back of like the very, very backlog of my things I want to get to. Yes. Just because you've Same. talked a lot about you've talked a lot about Ross and and stuff like that, and I just want to, I'd like to learn more about that and how that stuff works because I feel like there's a from from hearing your uh, job search and stuff like that that there seems to be a growing niche of mechanical engineer and programming fields like a hybrid. Yes, where if you if you understand how machines work and 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 how machines are controlled and how they're coded. But also knowing programming and software development side, there seems to be a growing hybrid role for that. And I'm kind of interested in, in that. It's, so It's a mechatronics engineering role. And nobody gives it that name, but that's exactly what it is. And that name is so cool. It's, it's such a, a lost opportunity for a naming role. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, I would really like to get a good robot arm that's Ross compatible, not even necessarily Ross compatible because you can write your own things for Ross and they're not that hard. Um, That's something that is, it's not on the back burner for me. Honestly, it's, it's something that I'm constantly on the lookout for. Uh, There's a couple, I think the Dexter robot is one that is like a higher payload. Uh, DIY six axis robot uses machined aluminum parts and some bigger stepper motors. I think it'll do three or four pa- kilograms of payload. And, but it ends up being, it's a pretty expensive build. I think it's like four or five grand by the time you build everything out. Oh, wow. So it's, again, it's kind of cost prohibitive. Maybe we should just build a movie or two. <laughs> At, just add it to the list. I mean, of things we're gonna make. I, I do have the uh, the that red robot arm from RCL with uh, controller, and I have an earlier version of that thing. It's a little four axis guy, and it worked at one point. I don't know if it still does. Oh, he was fully submerged in the flood. Who knows? He's all driven with roller chains. It is like the most steampunk robot arm I've ever seen. (laughs) It's very cool, though. Hmm. Anything else you've been working on? Trying to think. Uh, This will release after Christmas, right? Mm, Yes. Seeing as how it's in, what, two days? Yes, Christmas is Wednesday. Okay, uh, I redid an axe this week for Chris for uh, 
his uh his partner that I was really really pleased with got got to spend some time with the angle grinder and the twenty different grits of sandpaper and then cut the crap out of my knuckle on the extremely sharp axe that I was polishing and um are they are are they doing axe throwing with you that is the plan mm. they were uh a very good um, in our practice runs towards the end of the season. So I think I think plan is that they're going to do league with me this year. So I'm pretty stoked. No, I might need to do one now. You should. So much fun. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of you and Chris and Laura. So that sounds like a fun time. Axe League is so much fun. And the pizza's good and everybody's nice and there's good beer and just throw axes at targets. <laughs> There's nothing to not like. The only thing that would make it better is if there were dogs. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that I've been working really hard on is workshop organization. Um, oh, yes. Yep. So I had a couple of projects last week where I spent more time looking for my tools than I spent working on the projects. And um, so then I, I just kind of went nuts and I tore the whole shop apart and reorganized a bunch of my tools. And I'm in the process of figuring out where some of the other ones are going to go now and um, kind of preliminary planning for when the big CNC is done and how that's going to change my shop. Because the big CNC is going to go where a lot of my other tools are now. And those tools are going to have to find a new home. One of the things that might have to find a new home is my server rack that is currently disused in the side of my shop. And it might be where my toolboxes end up. So it's probably going to be where my toolboxes end up. There's no power outlet there. So yeah, that's pretty much what I've been working on. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's been a lot. Okay. <laughs> I've actually been working on my workshop a lot as well. Uh, I'm actually at a point now where I'm starting to actually make stuff that aren't machines or tools. What? I don't believe and it. And it's awfully fun. I don't believe it. Not for a second. I'm just making stuff for fun. And it's very liberating. Um, uh, let's see. If you're following me on Twitter... You'll on uh, at Aaron makes. I had posted a bunch of pictures of my um, honk for impeachment posters. <laughs> so I went. I went to the local impeachment rally, and it was like the night before. And I'm like, you know, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna do this because it's a Tuesday night. Um, I'm. Ex I've always. I've always been. In, uh, I don't know concerned or whatever that you know all these protests and rallies are during working hours and i'm like any normal person with a job isn't gonna be able to attend them but these were all scheduled at like five and they're five on a tuesday which is when i'm normally I'm not sure i understand damn it siri <laughs> damn it <laughs> i had like a wall of text on my apple watch oh my just God. all the crap that i had tried to say anyways <laughs> this is this this rally was on a you know, Aaron, 5 p.m on a the guy who hates <laughs> everything that's listening <laughs> yep you're why i have no home automation in my house you know that right because of all of our conversations and i'm like i'll be a hypocrite if i get a google home <laughs> it's been such like a 180 turn for me <laughs> and like i've had people at the space be like what happened Aaron?" like you were the one that inspired me to go full open source, full local hosted. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I still am an advocate for that. If you have the time and energy and effort to do that, <laughs> I no longer have any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> I just need my phone to work. Yeah. Anyways, I was excited that the rally was on, like on a Tuesday night, which is normally when I'm at the space. So like, it's already like a spouse approved. I'm going to be gone night. Right. And, uh, so I, I spent Monday evening making these really fun posters. I ended up, because my, my design constraint was I can't cut anything. 
like, I, well, I don't want to do any like saw or woodworking, like cutting dust, making stuff in my basement because I'm trying to keep it clean. I can't paint because we have Frey in the house and Jamie just hates me when I paint in the basement. So I can't cut wood and I can't paint. So I'm like, well, what can I, what, with those design constraints, what can I make, you know, to make a poster board? So I ended up getting the, uh, what's that called? Coroplast? Yes. Which is the the plastic stuff that like political signs are made out of. Yeah. And then I bought actual black poster board and I put that in the emblazer, which cuts very nice. So I was able to cut very big letters, very clear. And it said honk for impeachment. That was one of the requested signs that the the rally organizer wanted. But then I also added the uh, the untitled goose <laughs> with the little uh, honk, honk like things. Yeah, it was great. So I, I so I spent you know a couple of hours making those um, Monday night, and I was half and I guess it was Monday evening ish when I was planning this out, and I was just about to you know start making everything. I'm like, wait, this is gonna be at five ish o'clock or five thirty. It's already dark by then. Yeah. Like, is anybody going to see my signs? And, you know, they're like, oh, we'll bring flashlights. And they were doing some thing where people will hold signs and people will stand with flashlights in front of you and, like, hold that. I'm like, that sounds stupid. <laughs> I'm like, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I'm like, well, what if I, what if I backlit my signs? I'm like, well, how the heck am I going to do that? Mm. What, if I front light, what if I front light them? Next year, okay, I got an I can idea. See, I can see that. I can see that happening. So what I ended up doing is I got those, like three of those uh, small oval blue LED work lights from Harbor Freight. I love those things they, for everything. Like th- three or four dollars, and then they even have them for free with any purchase. Yes, often. So, so Jamie actually bought a light, found the coupon online. <laughs> you then got a second light for free. <laughs> <laughs> So I had three of those lights, and I um, 3D modeled and printed some uh, mounts. So I just have like one by it's, it's it's like one by two lath or whatever mm-hmm. for my for my handles, and I just screwed it into that or bolted it, I guess. I was going to do a magnet mount because those those um, lights have magnets in the back. Yes, I in my test run because the mount was kind of out. Sticking out seven inches is very springy. And any movement, the light would just fling right off. <laughs> so they weren't strong enough. And I'm like, well, fuck it. I'm just going to hot glue it. So I hot glued them and they, was, it, they were great. But not to make, that was, I talked way longer than I wanted to on that. <laughs> but I got so many compliments on those signs. Everyone was like, wow, did you get those made? Like professionally made? Like easily the best signs there. Because no one else... Had theirs backlit, of course. Yeah. Or I guess front lit. And uh, so my my wife went with me and we ended up, uh, because we had about, you know, 50 some, 60 some people there on one corner. And I'm like, well, we can't get a whole lot of visibility from here. And if we want to make the most impact, we're going to have to like split from the group. So we went across the street to another intersection and then we covered both because we, we both, I made like. I don't know why. I made three of the same sign. I guess I kind of figured I would like hand them out, <laughs> but then I, but then I didn't. But anyway, so my wife was on one corner or one, one side and I was on the other side of a corner so we can get like 90 degrees of view or, right. or more. Maximum honks. Yeah. Maximum honks. And we did get all the honks. We had so many people honking their horns. It was great. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was awesome. Yeah, what else have I been doing? I took notes. So I wouldn't forget. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. A couple a couple interesting things. A fun product that I'm I just started before we started recording. Um I had I had posted a tweet seeing if uh anybody was interested in me doing some live streams or some sort of live hangout type thing. Cause I'm starting to work more in my workshop at night and I could use someone to talk to. So I, I'm like, Hey, we're not, we're not good would, enough for you, Aaron. Come on, come on. 
I'm always you around. You can join. I'm always around. Um, Too often. Yeah, so I threw that out there, and, like, I had a decent, a decently positive response of people saying, yeah, just do it. And we, we'd love to hang out. And I'm like, well, I can't really guarantee any sort of schedule. <laughs> It'd be like, hey, I got some time tonight. I'll be working on the workshop for an hour or two or three. So I don't know what that's going to look like yet. That but seems to get a really positive interaction when people do that. What? Just like random? Yeah. It, it definitely, I feel like it'd be, it'd feel more organic, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a bit limited edition ish. Like if you're available, come hang out. Yeah. You I, know, type thing. I've definitely thought about doing it, but then the antisocial joke kicks in and is like, but yeah, but then you could listen to an audio book instead. Uh, <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> if I was no audio book, I'd have to be driving or like doing nothing. Yeah. Anyways, so I'm trying to come up with, like, how, how would, what would that look like if I did a live stream and I worked on random shit around the workshop? Like, like, what would that setup look like? And that's kind of what I'm trying to figure out. Because also YouTube has some dumbass rule where you have to have a thousand followers to stream from mobile. Yeah. You know what so doesn't have, have that dumbass rule? Hmm. Facebook Live. Um, fuck that. <laughs> Just saying. Um, I host my own goddamn stream <laughs> with blackjack. <laughs> <laughs> so and not I hookers, have a, cause I have a wise cam version two that I've just had forever. I think I picked up at Murph last year when we went to oh, uh, micro center, micro center. Yeah. On the way. So I've been sitting on that forever. And there's some open source software for it that adds a self-hosted R RTSP. Yes. R the real time R RTMP. Streaming, whatever. RTMP. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, that thing. It'll it'll host that on the camera itself. Mm -hmm. So then it, you can actually it, it it hosts its own little server, so you can then consume that stream however you want. It only it works on five volts, one amp. And I've got a 20,000 milliamp hour battery pack. Yes. I'm thinking I could head mount the Wise Cam. Yes. <laughs> battery pack. <laughs> and then you can get like a first person view of what I'm working on. And then I'll also get like a second Wise Cam like in the corner of the shop. So you can kind of see like a, see everything and then see what I'm doing. Then maybe just have a third one, just like you would have on top of a monitor. Yeah, I wonder how. Because then, then you can. I'm thinking you can bring them all into OBS. Yes, you can. And have them in like a picture in picture in picture type thing. Yes. Make it a whole scene. Relatively easily too. Yeah, I, I've messed with OBS a little bit. I wonder how motion sicky your first person view would make me. <laughs> I guess it depends on what you're doing. Um, yeah, I've I've thought about doing the same thing because um, there's ways you can stream through DSLRs. And yeah, I've seen that. I've thought about doing that for like my tool changer conversion and things like that because I'm bad about editing. I have thousands of hours of project footage that has never been put together and nobody's seen because yeah. I, I love setting up shots and I love doing all of that. I do not like putting it together mostly because I don't like watching myself. I'll, I'll, I can barely edit this audio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone video. Yeah. <laughs> like, Oh God, look at that idiot. Um, so I don't know. What about um, Instagram? You're against that I don't too, have right? That Instagram listens to you, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, it's owned by Facebook, and your Apple Watch listens to you, apparently. So you already gave into that world. Um, yeah, but I, I do trust Apple a little bit more than any of the others. I'm just trying to think of maker platforms. What about Twitter? Does Twitter do streams? Tw Telescope. Or Periscope. Periscope is what it's called. Periscope. I am 
I am. They were actually the first on ones. For... Really? Yeah. Yeah. It was a big deal when they started. Like, people were taking Periscope into really sketchy situations, like strip clubs and shit. And they were like, how do we lock this down? <laughs> I mean, the CUI is odd. I'm on, I'm on that. I'm on the Periscope site now. I didn't tell you it was good. I told you it existed. <laughs> <laughs> it is very in your face, the UI. I don't know what to think. But yeah, so I'm open to ideas for a platform for that. If you have any ideas, you want to randomly hang out with me. Or Google Hangouts. Suggestions. Yeah, I thought about that, but then you only did 10, and I don't know. You think more than 10 people doing... are going to hang out with you? Hey, I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree with you, though. I think more than 10 people probably would, eventually. That's the thing, is, like, it's kind of like, you know, when we were doing the talk stage at... Maker Fest, and everyone was like, "Well, I don't want to go do my talk because nobody's like sitting there waiting for me to do my talk." I'm like, just go up there and talk to the to the void, and in a couple of minutes, people will join. Like, if you do it enough, that's how we did the put- <laughs> and you do it loud <laughs> enough, enough people will start to be like, "Hmm, I wonder what this guy's doing." If he has something interesting to say, I bet he's going to hurt himself tonight. I would like to join into that. You know. <laughs> That's exactly how we started the podcast. It really is. Like <laughs> we we just yelled and we just ranted into the void. Yes. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Which brings up a good question for our listeners. We're trying to figure out ways to spread the word of the podcast. If you have any ideas, let us know on Twitter or email or whatever. Because we're not great at this. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> Lies. Um, no, we're not marketing geniuses. We just make things. Sometimes. We're just, we're just normal geniuses. <laughs> Aaron. <laughs> I didn't say it. Um, <laughs> so... This will drop right before the new year, right? Sure. Yeah. Like, you know, we're seven days away. Um, the new year? Yeah. Shoot. Maybe eight. If, if we're eight, I can't remember. We're 55 minutes from seven, so it's close enough. Uh, what do you want to do in 2020? Makey wise, not not podcast wise, makey wise. It's a very good question. Because I talked to your off a lot about this a couple of days ago. But I already forgot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so I got the I got the uh, your CNC mini mill fully operational. Ah, that yeah. I bought from you, and by fully operational, it already worked. Um, I just messed with the pie that was on it. So it's running the same Gerbil controller that you had on it. Um, I just reflashed the pie that was on there from running uh, BCNC to running CNCJS. I'm a big fan of it so far. For something that just runs G-code, yeah. like, I'm a big fucking fan of CNCJS. Like, I, I just pulled up on my laptop, it broadcasts a web server. The UI is real clean. <sighs> You just upload the G code and you know, you position it. The probing actually makes sense. Like that was my big thing with oh BC and C was everything was all over the fucking place. No, yeah, the BC and C I mean interface was like anyone I'm not who, arguing that, who looks at Linux C and C and is like, this is confusing. I just like B C and C is like, hold my beer. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> like like I, I hit a soft limit. And I got to go to, like, three different tabs to clear shit and then, like, reconnect. Like, it, it was dumb. If you're lucky, and then the, you and might then the have probe. to restart the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so see, after doing that, and I'm like, I, didn't, I don't want to, like, spend this time learning the controller software. I like 
I, and I always say this, that I like, I like UIs that you don't need training on. Right. Like a good UI, you just kind of figure it out. Like, it's kind of intuitive. Yeah. And that's it's pretty much what it was. Like, I just spent, like, you know, a minute just looking around the UI, seeing what was there. There's a probe button. And, well, there's a probe widget. In the probe widget, there's different buttons as far as which G-code probe commands. Mm-hmm. So you have, like, an option of which ones to do. And then you hit the probe button. And it says, all right, here's the G-code I'm going to run. Do you want to add the tool offset to it? You know, it's the radio button. And I'm like, yeah, I think I'm good. So I said probe, then it probes, and then it adds, you know, however much it moved, and it just did it. <laughs> I'm like, it was that that easy, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Does it do XY probing too? Mm, I don't think so. Not by default. Um, it looks like I could add custom G code to it. So I could add a custom probe command to it. So there's been a couple companies coming out with these really cool uh corner mounted probe plates that have a hole in them on on uh, like it fits onto the corner of your workpiece and then it's got a hole out to the side of the workpiece and you run a custom probe routine which probes the top of the plate and then brings the bit into the inside of that hole and it'll bump y and it'll bump x and it will give you all three offsets for your G54 coordinate system in one command. And, Interesting. Um, I think Shapeoko just came out with a version, uh, or Carbide 3D, whatever they're called. Uh, Ooze Nest has a really nice version that I actually debated on buying. And there's been a couple of companies that have had a version that works with Mach 3 for, like, ever. Um, I really want to build one for Linux CNC. And as I dig deeper into Linux CNC and writing custom modules and building Mesa configurations, that's the other thing I did. I'd spent like a week and a half building a really nice Mesa controller for a CNC machine that I was helping a friend with. And I'm so much more confident in that. And I don't ever want to go back to parallel ports. Um, but uh, now I really want to build one of those like for my machine. It, I, I see that coming as like an ancillary thing after the big machine's done. Because for Linux CNC, you, you build that into the interface and it becomes like a custom G code that you run uh, with with some like radio buttons and their Pi mm-hmm. control thing. Yeah, because that's all just a Python plugin that you can write, right? Yes. For Linux CNC, yeah. And I've added the Z probing to my router and I added that like a year and a half ago. I have no idea how I did it. Um, but the fact is it's there and I can go back and I can look at it. Uh, so that's cool. So I'd like to figure out how to do the X, Y and that little probe plate. I don't know. I might end up yeah. buying the ooze nest one. It's really nice. It uses a, uh, a three conductor, eighth inch jack like a headphone jack that with the mic input Mm -hmm. and it plugs into the side and it's got it's it's really well done and the ooze nest guys are pretty cool so i don't yeah i don't mind sending them like i think it's like 40 bucks it's it's nicely machined but i want to make it myself nobody can sell me anything that i can make because i just i want to make it but now i need to it's that whole project debt thing that we always talk about. It's like, should I just oh, yeah. give somebody 40 bucks and <laughs> be excited that they made something nice for me? <laughs> Even though I could. So, make for it. my goals for 2020, <laughs> <laughs> got that mill going. And over the, we- over the uh, weekend, I had, to, uh, I had to go to my in laws for Christmas. I'm sorry. It's not Christmas yet, but everybody was there. Right. Uh, my daughter has been running, been, she likes to take my glasses and wear them around. And it's real fucking cute. <laughs> but she put them on the ground and then some other kids just ran over them. So I went most of the weekend without my glasses until I got home. 
But that entire time, I'm, I'm like, I'm on Slack. I'm on looking for new frames. I'm like, Joe, how hard would it be to, to mill some new frames? Like out of aluminum. He's like, mill a fucking cube first. <laughs> <laughs> then come back. <laughs> That's fair. You know, it's like, ah. Uh. I turned your turned that mill on. Let's now do the most complex 3D geometry I could think of. <laughs> so I think that's going to be my goal for 2020 is to to learn milling and machining enough to to do that by summer. That's something I that I also decent. very much want to do. So I 100% support it. Yeah. I think I think that'd be a really fun project and be super maker cred to have some I'm thinking doing like brushed aluminum, anodizing it like gunmetal gray with some um the bright chrome like fittings. You guys are really missing like out on screws. Aaron's expression as he's describing this. Yeah. <laughs> I got I got some hand gestures so I can fully articulate it through audio. <laughs> it's not just the hand gestures. <laughs> <laughs> it's the head bob yeah. and the eyebrows. It's fucking great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's probably my big goal for the for the year as far as maker stuff. That and getting the workshop like done done. Well, that's never. I do want to. That will always be your goal. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm pretty good with once things are are settled. Like I'm good with saying it's good. Like the the shelving I've I've had for years. Like they just it was at the house when I bought it. I just like throw my shit on it. Mm-hmm. Like. And it's worked well enough, but now it's just it's convoluted. Yep. And I want to I want to get everything off of the shelves and onto I want I want to do like a French cleat wall, and then make some French cleat organizers for everything. So I think that's like the next step for the workshop is get everything off of shelves and onto the wall. But I think once I get that done, I should I I don't have a whole lot of tools, but that should get just about everything off the shelf. I also want to do one of those um. Rolling carts like Adam Savage has in his shop, with all the pliers and all. He has there's a YouTube video of the the rolling tool cart. Is it like the vertical carts like, that we just built at the space? Yes. Okay. But not not pegboard. Okay. But it's got just it's just you know one by twos or you know one by fours, and there's just like a bunch of holes driven drilled horizontally. And so you can just like anything with handles can just like sit in. Oh, like um, like one of the members posted when we were talking about the yeah. pegboard ones. So so David, yes, yeah. So yeah, so David made one based off of his video. That's so that's essentially what it is. I was trying not to name drop random members, but you know whatever, that's fine too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's just it's just a one by four like a frame rolling tool cart, and instead of shelving or pegboard, it's got. Uh, it's got boards kind of parallel to the floor, mm-hmm. so like they're flat parallel to the floor with just a bunch of just holes all along it. Just, you know, just wide enough that anything with, with like two handles, yeah. like pliers, anything, just the back handle just sits right in there. So now everything is kind of facing up. It's right there. You just grab, you can see the, 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 uh, what, it, I don't know what you'd fucking call it, the, the, the business end. The implement end. Of the tool. Yeah, you can just see the business end and know exactly what you're looking for. The penchy cut version? Yes. I want that on, because I feel like the wall, the French cleat wall will be great for getting everything organized and off the shelf, but I might not be working in that corner that I plan on having the wall, the French cleats. I might want the tool somewhere else. Yes. So I have a toolbox that I literally throw all of my most used tools in, and I'm constantly rummaging through it. Yep. I feel like that everything in that toolbox will be on the cart. And I just roll it around as needed, pull the shit off, put it back. That's why I've gone to tool bags. Like tool bags that have pockets lining. And then I just got a new one um, that's a husky bag that has a center liner. And it's got like double stacked pockets. So like all of my pliers are in those pockets vertically ready to grab and I can kind of tell which ones they are and like that just sounds like what i have but with extra steps sort of <laughs> sort of there's less rummaging the bag is definitely more organized than the box yeah but 
It's easy to carry around. I carry my, I move my tools around more than I care to deal with. Yes. And that's why in my shop, I've gone to the whole like, uh, first order availability thing that Adam Savage also does where I have like five sets of Allen wrenches because I have a set of Allen wrenches in my office area where all my printers are. I have a set near my routers. I have a set on the other side by my laser cutter in my middle. <laughs> like there might be three sets of the same tool in the same room, but I also don't have to go more than two steps to get to them. Nice. And that keeps me from like losing them. In theory, in practice, it's a little less good unless I keep up on things myself. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm trying to shoot for, too, It's just I, I want a thing. I know exactly I, I want to know exactly where it is and I can just get to it. Yes. I can just reach out and grab it without dicking around trying to find it. Yep. Or, is it in this box? Is it in this box? Yes. Is it in this pile? Done a clean up after myself, after my last project. I've been, so I've actually, with my, with my new workbenches that I have, it's been very satisfying having a giant, it's a two foot by eight foot workbench just cleared, ready to go for the next thing. Yep. I've been, I've been trying to do, I've been trying to work towards when I'm done with something to put everything away and clear off that bench. So it's ready for the next time. I just want to throw something on there and work on it. And that's been very satisfying. Like this past week, this past day and a half, I've been trying to soft mod an original Xbox. And I easily quickly took up that entire bench just with shit, trying to get that thing to fucking get modded. Yeah. And this issue after issue. And, but it was just really nice having a nice clear bench ready to go. And once I've called it quits on that stupid fucking thing, <laughs> I, I threw it out, put all my tools away. And it's ready to go again. Wait, you threw it thing. out? Oh, yeah, it's in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had it close to working. So, oh, I did. Let me tell you about it. <laughs> so I was going to soft mod it, which means I got to get a specific, like, w like a specific game out of four. So I had one of the splinter cells. Um, just about... So I had the splinter cells, then you have to download a specific game save for it. And the save and the game save is what exploits it. So there's a bug, there's a vulnerability in the game itself. If you're if you're if it loads a save file and it does some funky thing, then it gets root access. That's how you get the mod, you get the soft mod into the into the Xbox. Oh my god. But the the challenge I ran into was I bought an original Xbox memory card and which, you know, just plugs into your controller and then it shows up in the Xbox. But how do you get the file, the save files on it when they're on the computer? In the past, you know, when these things came out, people are running XP and all that crap. So like you just do it. Like you can just run action replay or something and it just shows up as a USB drive and you just like drag and drop it over or... You had to use a program called Explorer 360, which reads this. It, it's like a. It's called Fat X, which is like a specific file system for the Xbox. It'll read that. You just drag and drop it over. But the issue I had is in Windows 10, nothing shows up the way it's supposed to. You're like, oh well, there's some missing DLLs that you have to download and install. I'm like, all right, that's fine. I've done that before. Get those in there, but the drive still doesn't show up. I'm like, well, what? What the heck? And so I'm you know, Googling all, everywhere and I do, I do all the suggestions, nothing works. And I'm getting close to giving up and people are like, oh, well, in, under XP, it just works. I'm like, all right. So I just found an old hard drive that I laying around, threw it in one of my desktops and install, downloaded XP, got that installed. <laughs> and I, I had to fucking install Action Replay. If you remember what that is, where you just, you know, install cheat codes onto things. Yeah. Then, so I had to install Action Replay. Still didn't show up. I had to plug my thing in, which, by the way, you can't just plug in a memory card 
into a computer. No. So I had to disassemble. You either buy a special adapter for it, which is like five or ten bucks, but I don't want to like wait. So I disassembled the memory card. I cut up, I hacked up a, uh, a USB cable <laughs> and I soldered directly onto the pins <laughs> in the right format, in the right way. So I can just like plug it in like a USB drive, the memory card. And the thing is, I did this, you know, I did it right, but it still doesn't show up right. I'm like, what the hell? So under XP, I plugged my, my, my hacked up memory card in, installed Action Replay. I had to go into the fucking Windows Device Manager and tell it, hey, this unknown device, I need you to use these Action Replay drivers as if it's an Action Replay cable. And like, that wasn't mentioned anywhere in like any of the documentation for any of these things because it should have just worked. So I finally got that done. That took me like a day and a half of fucking with to get that to work. Then I'm like, sweet, got this, got the game saves on. Now I can actually like soft mod the thing. I put my Splinter Cell game in. Can't read the disc. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, all right, fine, whatever. It's an old drive. Maybe I got to clean the, clean the laser lens. I read that, you know, you can do it. There's a potentiometer on like all DVD drives. That that adjusts the laser power, um, so you can if it's if it's sometimes it gets weakened over time. You got to increase the power you send it. So I, I cleaned the lens with some isopropyl alcohol, did the pot tweak. Also, there's a capacitor. There's a, there's a known capacitor in all draw, all Xboxes up to version one point six, where it will it will leak. The capacitor just leaks all of the motherboard. And it just, just like shorts things out, makes a huge mess. So went that, you ripped that out, um, put the drive back together. Still can't read the game. Not only that, but touching the hard drive and DVD drives, I get little shocks. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember. You I know. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was talking to people in, in Slack. I'm like, hey, I'm getting little shocks when I touch this. <laughs> is that, is that? A my house problem <laughs> or an Xbox problem. <laughs> I don't feel like I should be getting shocked touching this. <laughs> so yeah, after all that, I'm like, fuck this. I'm just I just threw it away. I too much time spent trying to get it to work. And the whole point was to sell it. Like I just I've I've been sitting on this Xbox for a couple of years now. Like I, I I I I had a thing where I wanted to collect vintage video games, and I haven't played any of them. Yeah, I just got rid of. So all now, mine. yeah. So I'm just gonna sell it. I'm like, well, it's forty bucks stock on eBay, but it goes for over a hundred if it's soft modded with games on it. So I'm like, all right, I'll spend a day get things soft modded, get some games on it. But now, fuck that. I didn't even want to play it. So I threw it out. That was um, that was dedication, absolute dedication. The best part is, did you get XP running on a modern computer? I mean, it was it's a Dell Optiplex, so I mean it's a Intel quad core from like two thousand nine ish. Okay, so it's something reasonable that could have ran XP at some point. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure it ran XP or seven. Okay, at when it was released, so. Okay, that's different. I was thinking you got it to run on like a fairly recent computer. I was like, how? <laughs> I mean, I did. I did manage to uh, write it to a USB drive and boot it from that. I wasn't even sure if that would work, but it did. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah, that was a whole lot of work. It really was. And it's like, well, I mean, I don't have, my, I don't have anything else going on. Like, I can just do this. It'll make me some more money when I go to sell it. But then, you know, it's issue after issue. And even if I did get it fully modded, like, I wouldn't feel comfortable just selling it because there's other shit wrong with it. Right. Mm. Yeah, just threw it out. Yeah, I had a, a whole box full of vintage video games that went. Went to the e-cycler recently that it killed me. 
But at the same time, I was like, these haven't been plugged in in multiples of years. It's time. Did you see the end result uh, memory card cable that I made? Yes. I posted on Twitter. So uh, it was initially just uh, just a male USB cable going into the memory card. Throughout the day, as I tried different things, I ripped out the memory card PCB. <laughs> and, I, and then Maybe I started I a female USB. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, 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 became, it became like a Rube Goldberg memory card cable. Where it's it's an empty husk of a memory card <laughs> with just the connector that I needed to to connect to the controller to so it went from the, the husk to a female USB you know adapter. So I'm like, okay, you can you, there are things you can use to use flash drives. So I tried all my different flash drives. None of them worked because it's very picky about what it accepts. Right. I'm like, well, fuck it. So I've got the the circuit board of the memory card, and I've got this additional you know USB mail adapter. So I soldered the mail adapter to the circ- to the memory card thing, then just plugged the male USB into the female USB, and got this like janky cable. Essentially, what I had twenty four hours prior, <laughs> but just worse. <laughs> Where where did you post this? I, I posted on Twitter. Yeah, I don't see it. No, oh no! Uh, did, you, did you post it on the, the the MOT page or your page? No, it was on my page. No, nope, you didn't. Is it? You failed, mm. or I failed. Oh, Tweets. L- looking. I did. It was, it was three hours ago. <sighs> it looks dumb. <laughs> Like just looking at it, I, I'm I'm sorry that I posted it because I look like a moron. They'd be like, "Why didn't you just solder the th- the mail on directly?" I'm like, "Well, that's what I started with." I do not see this. Th- oh, there it is. There it is. Tweets and replies. Yeah. Yeah. What the, what what did you do? <laughs> right? Yeah, it looks dumb. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it worked though. I- it was great. Yeah, I I got the files on there. It's just you, you can't argue dry, with results, winnered. but damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really like why? Like if if you didn't have the backstory, you'd be like, wow, he, Aaron's a moron. <laughs> like why wouldn't he just solder the cable on directly? Why would he go all this roundabout way of whatever this is? But really, really, this allows you to abstract away the need for the memory card. You could either use the memory card or a flash drive. This sounds like the convoluted ways you've explained programming to me. And <laughs> it really is. I am uh, <laughs> really far into this crawler. <laughs> I'm not quite sure anymore. Yeah. So, after all that, I'm going to tell you my one goal for 2020 Maker Joe. That is to take on less and to finish more. Wow. That's my goal. Wow. It's so measurable. You know, it, it is so. So specific. It is. Is that a smart goal? It is, though, because, um, I mean, we can measure it by, like, Joe, did you take on any projects that are um, unfinishable this week? And if I say no, I'm following my goal. And if I say yes... I'm feeding into the self-destructive behavior that has got me where I am. But it is pretty fun. So maybe I'll say yes occasionally still. Does that seem reasonable? I don't know. No. Well, the crawler is empty. It's not specific. And I... <laughs> it's not measurable. There's no action. There isn't. There is an action. There's no there's no results and there's no time based you know measurement. There is so an action and there goal. are results. More completions and more no's. Those are those are those are actions and results. How many more? I'm not going into that. You're not my mom. You, know, you don't know how I live. 
You know, you know I, I just heard the other week in one of our team meetings that we're moving away from SMART goals to something... More abstract? And <laughs> it is more abstract. Like, it's another acronym. It's supposed to be easier. But they somehow managed to fit two words into one letter of an acronym, which made no sense. <laughs> and I just can't remember what it was. But Isn't there a yeah. term I'm like, for reverse acronyming something? Like coming up I with mean, the name and then turning that into an acronym. I mean, is that not a recursive acronym? Yeah, but there's like a name. It's buzzy and it's funny. I don't remember what it is. Cool. <sighs> All right. What else you got? Got anything else? We've been doing this for a while. Um, I did get an email update from Kyle. On the Ultimate Excel printer. Yeah? Yeah. He uh, he sent he sent out an email to all the people who were in the batch one pre-orders. Um, apparently, he missed the first... Apparently, he missed the uh, delivery date that was originally promised. I didn't really know when that was. But he said that he underestimated how much work putting kits together would be. And he overestimated his own abilities to 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 get things made, but he he's been very clear and upfront, um, which has been really nice. And I uh, as I suggested that maybe have you know weekly email updates if he's that behind, just keep people in the loop. Yeah, and because everybody was super, so like he managed to include everybody in the email, like not buy a carbon copy or whatever. Right. So just everybody was cc'd. But like everybody has been super supportive. They're like, "Hey man, don't worry. You know, we know we trust you, and we like what you're. You know, we we like what you're doing, and would, you know, would rather get it right than <laughs> not. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, that's been nice. No one's been really bitchy about it, which has been great. And I just said, you know, hey, you know, maybe you know, do some. This, it was a nice email. Like he, you know, he explained, you know, he's been having some issues with you know sourcing and stuff like that, and. Uh, you know, maybe have more of these updates to, you know, make sure people feel more comfortable about waiting longer. It sounds like typical growing pains. And, you know, yeah. like, I don't know if you ever followed any of Brooks posts from like PrinterBot when they were doing um, like their blogs and stuff. But at one point they said that it was actually almost, if not exactly the same amount of effort to kit out the PrinterBot simples is building the printer bot simples. So like the effort that went out was the same to just like build the printer and send you a, a complete shipped printer versus a kit that you had to build. The effort on their part was the same. Interesting. And I completely believe that I've kitted out printers to give to people before. And it takes forever to count out bolts and nuts and washers and like, I totally could have built a printer in the time it took me to get out a printer. Totally. Without a doubt. <laughs> so I, uh, I very much understand where he's coming from. It's probably why I didn't get an email back from him today. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But nah, I hope he does good. I'm glad he got, he got a good team of first batch orders that mm-hmm. aren't all pissy pants the first time something went wrong. Like, yeah. Yeah. Everybody seems super supportive in the email chain. So that's nice. It, like I kind of would expect that like, the people that would buy first batch pre-orders for a printer that expensive at what they're saying. I, I feel like they know what they're getting and from who they're getting it from. Like they mm. purposely spent that money. So and I have no doubt that he will fulfill with amazing things. Mm-hmm. I think that's it for me. I got to pee. <laughs> that rhymed. You're a poet. You didn't even know it. I was done like 10 minutes ago, so we can, All right. we can kill this anytime. Keep making stuff, guys. This is the end of the podcast.